I want to begin by thanking the North Central Jurisdictional Committee on Episcopacy for the cake. <laughs> Seriously, Bishop Dick and I are in agreement that you have blessed us by insisting we participate in this retirement service. Because I believe we tried to dodge it, thinking, you know, the time had passed and that you had done more than enough to recognize our ministry. So thank you so very, very much. As I begin my preparations for these reflections and this retirement celebration, I ran across the remarks I shared with the Iowa General and Jurisdictional Conference Delegation on February 24, 2000, after they had voted to nominate me as an Episcopal candidate. How I discovered this document, I'll never know. It was not on my computer. <laughs> Among other comments, I made the following statement. And I quote, whether I'm elected a bishop or not, I will continue to offer leadership and vision to the church. My commitments are these. I was bold to pursue unity in Christ without sacrificing integrity to the gospel message of inclusiveness, justice, love, and personal salvation. To remain passionate about making disciples of Jesus Christ who are equally committed to spiritual formation and a just society. To work for the renewal, centrality, and vitality of worship and preaching. To be personally involved in calling and equipping effective leaders for the church who are willing to be obedient to our historic and connectional values of mutual support and accountability, to teach and model those areas of ministry that dominate the gospel record of Jesus' ministry, namely prayer, healing, and the use of money, to help develop new faith communities and new models of ministry that are life-giving and transformative, to advocate for our global church to give itself away for the sake of Christ, to break down barriers to participation in the church for all God's people. And finally, to remember in every setting and relationship that I am in, that, in relationship that I am in the business of raising the dead. By the grace of God and the support of exceptional conference leadership teams and appointive cabinets in the West Ohio, Minnesota, and Dakota's conferences, I've made every effort to fulfill these commitments throughout my 20 years as a residential bishop, and even now in my role as the executive secretary of the Council of Churches. But I will leave it to others to judge if I approximated any of these goals. I could name significant Holy Spirit breakthroughs in each of these areas, as well as many times when my human failings, prejudices, and personal preferences limited outcomes in every one of these areas. Revisiting my comments to the Iowa delegations reminded me that my entire episcopacy has been dominated by the issue of schism. Like nearly all of my contemporaries, and almost all of you, I have known nothing else. Nearly 23 years ago, I said this to the delegations in Iowa. I believe the United Methodist Church has been devoted, uh, has been be detoured, excuse me, or at least distracted from our vision and mission. The distraction is so great that our beloved church is on the verge of schism. This widening gulf in the church is being driven by the three P's of conflict. Power, who will control decision-making processes. Purpose, what is our mission and mission delivery structure and position? Who is more right or righteous? The specific battlegrounds have become all too familiar and painful, doctrine, homosexuality, apportionments, authority of scripture. End of quote. But then I went on to say, schism may be the perceived risk facing our church, 
But the greater risk is that we fail to stay in love with God and our neighbors. Our unity will be in a renewed relationship with Christ. Our unity will never be in agreement on issues or even all elements of Christian doctrine. And this is not in my notes, but I just feel compelled to say it. Folks, even on the other side of all this disaffiliation, we will still be confronted with whether or not we are going to base everything we do on our love of God and our love of neighbor. That has been the experience of the church since the first century. We will continue to fragment the body of Christ until we comprehend and practice the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we are filled with the fullness of God. I have been a captive of Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus, which Shar read this afternoon, since my first reading as a new Christ follower. I could hardly imagine, let alone believe, that God intended for me to be a part of the incarnational mystery to be a part of God's incarnational plan, to be filled with the fullness of God. Imagine that. At 16, when I first said yes to Jesus, I expected this fullness to be soon achieved. At nearly 72, I now understand the journey will continue until I rest in God's eternal arms. I thank God for the many individuals in this room and beyond these walls who nurtured me on my journey, who have shown me God's pathways and given me the opportunities to develop as a person, as a disciple, as a leader, as a bishop of the church. For lack of time and my own memory, I dare not try to recall and name all who touched and shaped and encouraged my Episcopacy. But I do want to acknowledge the Jurisdictional Committee on Episcopacy and the North Central Jurisdiction College of Bishops for their unwavering support. And especially I want to acknowledge Bishop Reuben Job, who taught me to be attentive to God and who, even in death, remains my spiritual father. The Iowa Conference who launched me on this journey will always occupy a special place in my heart. As I acknowledged earlier, my effectiveness achieved, any effectiveness achieved in my residential assignments is the result of the extremely talented and dedicated conference leaders, leadership teams, and staff persons in West Ohio, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. I thank them for trusting me and following me when appropriate and for correcting me and teaching me when necessary. West Ohio in particular bore with great grace the task of accepting and raising up a young rookie bishop. And the Dakotas in Minnesota welcomed me home even though I had clearly been the prodigal. I love my wife, Shar, and I thank God for the blessing she brings my life. For 46 years now, she has been my daily inspiration. Without her unwavering partnership and encouragement, I could not have pressed on. She, more than any other, helps me glimpse the fullness and the joyfulness of Christ's love. Thank you, Shar. Now, for those of you that know Shar, well, you know that she almost always has the last word. <laughs> and what is so aggravating to me is it's almost always the correct word. <laughs> we were about to purchase a retirement home in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area when Char said to me, 
perhaps we should look at Wisconsin, where we have six of our seven grandchildren. We went back and forth for several weeks about this. I was making my argument for the wonderful Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Char was making her argument for being closer to our grandchildren. And I thought I was winning. <laughs> and then Char pulled out the heavy artillery. And she said, I have been following you around for 40 years. All I could say was, we're going to Wisconsin. <laughs> and she was correct. We are having a wonderful time with our grandchildren and our families that live there, um, following our grandchildren as they are engaged in athletic and school activities, spending time with family that we have never lived close to because we had made ourselves fully itinerant to the church's uh, appointments. So it is good, and we uh, are delighted to be in that setting. In her book, The Cloister Walk, Kathleen Norris writes, by the way, this is one of my favorite books. She writes this, with God there is always more unfolding. That which we can glimpse of the divine is always enough and never enough. So my friends in Christ, the lay and clergy delegates of the 2022 Jurisdictional Conference and my Episcopal colleagues, the journey continues as we seek to press on. The fullness of God's yearnings for the United Methodist Church on the other side of our current uncertainty, messiness, and splintering will continue to unfold. But here is what we know of the divine intention in this moment. God intends each of you and me to be a part of God's great incarnational plan, to make known, to embody the fullness of Christ's love and light. God intends to fill the space within you that only God can fill. God intends, as the preacher of the morning said, God intends for you to bear within your very soul the resurrected Christ. This we know about the divine intention in this moment. This is God's intention. Paul prayed about it for this reason. So that we might literally overflow with the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So I know this is about our retirements, but I want to make this about you and to assure you, reassure you, that I will continue to pray for each of you, for each of our conferences, that this very prayer that Paul prayed will be, will be fulfilled, that you, and I will be filled with the fullness of God, that we will embrace being a part of the incarnational mystery. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Thank you, North Central Jurisdiction, for the honor and blessing of serving you.